Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to present here today. Uh, today, So today I will be showing a slightly different way of uh, analyzing relaxation decays by using inversal class transform. Um, I'm going to show that this method can be used to separate differently relaxing components that happen to have very similar or an overlapping chemical shifts. And that is kind of a very common feature in the soil materials, for example, in, bi in biological materials. Um, so, <clears throat> so, um, uh, so, in terms of uh, uh, relaxation and NMR, so I'm not, so we all are familiar with relaxation, so I don't really uh, need to advertise that as much. And we know that we can use this uh, to study um, molecular dynamics of different kinds of materials. And uh, depending on uh, what type of experiment we use, we can assess uh, our dynamics at different time scales. For example, we can look at uh, local flexibility, um, or we can also look at uh, slightly solar molecular motions, like for example, segmental motions of uh, all proteins. Today, I'm not going to be talking about relaxation uh, because it's quite a broad topic and very complicated topic but I can direct you to a look at a very nice review by uh, Paul Shanda and Matthias Ernst uh, that was published for years, a few years ago, where they gave a really nice overview of uh, relaxation in solid state. And in mind, give you quite a lot of um, examples. So when it comes to analyze relaxation data, we commonly use this, uh, so, so commonly how we process our relaxation data is that we use, we use to fit a uh, single exponential decay. And, uh, but then there are cases, for example, we might encounter like, a bit more complex relaxation behavior where we might suspect that our relaxation decay is a composite of multiple relaxing environments. And then in that case, to prove that, we can use this uh, stretch exponential. In cases where we're more familiar with the systems that we are looking at and we're expecting, know that we have, for example, two differently relaxing components, then we can fit with appropriate exponential function, like, for example, a double exponential function. However, uh, when we look at the biological materials, um, we might end up with a spectrum that looks something like this. So in here, I'm showing a one-dimensional spectrum of the collagen that is extracted from the bovine of the standard, and we can see that we have a lot of different signals coming out of here. Like, and in here, I have only assigned most prevalent, uh, uh, most prevalent amino acids, uh, no, most uh, uh, prominent NMR signals in this material. However, if we know anything about the proteins, then we know that there's at least 20 different amino acids, and all of them are going to be contributing to the, to the spectrum. And if we want to look at the dynamics of these materials, then uh, the analysis of relaxation decay might become slightly more complicated. Uh, one way of going about this is by, for example, doing a convolution of our uh, spectra and fit uh, appropriate signal, appropriate exponential decays to our signals. But what we what, what's supposed to be do when we have like um, overlapping resonances as it is, for example, in this aliphatic region. So, and potentially we might encounter like differently relaxing regions if we consider like large biological systems. Uh, so we, where we can have like faster and maybe slower motions happening at the same time. So we can potentially do the bit of the stretch exponential and improve that. Uh, however, um, I would like to present you today a, another way how we can do it. Uh, we can use this inversal class transform to process or relaxation dimension. So in terms of how it works, um, uh, and then the, the, the way the result, uh, the result output looks like is presented basically in this slide here. So firstly, as with all relaxation data, we use a Fourier transform to process or a uh, spectra, and we get a so we get our 
uh, decaying signals with respect to or recycling times as shown here. And then after that, we can use the inversal cross transform to process or decaying signals to get the, these um, uh, to get our uh, distributions of to get our distributions of relaxation times in here. So basically, we get this like two dimensional plot as shown here, uh, where on the axis here we have plotted our spectral uh, signals with respect to differently relaxing components. And in here, you can see that it's quite nice, nicely separating, for example, this alpha region, where it shows that we have uh, side chains that are uh, relaxing slightly faster compared to this uh, other carbons that are coming probably from the alpha or uh, beta chemical shifts. Uh, as the inversal class transform is an ill poised problem, it can have many possible solutions for a given relaxation decay. And to overcome this, we use statistical regularization methods um, to give a statistically reasonable solution. So if you want to know more about them, uh, I can direct you to go and have a look at these um, reviews. So, the inversal class transform uh, has already been used before to process relaxation data. And I would like to show you two examples where it has, where it has been used successfully previously. So the first example is from Lucio Friedman, where he used um, this uh, method to separate uh, uh, in a, two chemically in equivalent size for protopolar nuclei. So he prepared a mixture consisting of the sodium uh, sulfate and sodium carbonate. And when you record one dimensional AMR spectrum of sodium, you can see that we have a very featureless. Um, simple uh, signal, but we, but we know there are two different um, mine transactions underneath this signal. So we can use a relaxation analysis and process it by inversal class transform to separate these uh, two um, differently, to, to extract both of these different components as shown here. So as you can see, um, in the spectrum, we get slight uh, curving of the spectrum, but that is the, these are distortions that are due to the experimental artifacts, such as uh, uh, baseline artifacts. But we can correct them by uh, applying uh, the scale, uh, but we can correct them by applying the scale projections and uh, get or line shapes of both of these components um, and uh, yeah so, so we can get the line shape of both of these components out of it at the end that are separated uh, depending on their relaxation right uh, further in this paper they also looked at the effects of the signal to noise ratio what it has with what type of effect it has on when we use this uh, processing technique uh, with respect to the, how well these signals are set, how well these relaxation rates are uh, separated, uh, not separated as in how close they are. So if, if we have components that are relaxing fairly close to one another, then we need to use fairly good signal to noise uh, data. But if they are further apart, then the, the signal to noise can be slightly more forgiving. And further in this paper, I also get that stability separated three differently relaxing components as shown here. Um, another example has been shown by Utsami, where, they, where he and his co-workers used the proton longitudinal relaxation time to separate the uh, carbon state differently, um, to separate differently relaxing carbon 13 chemical shifts for the mixtures of small organic molecules. So he presented an example uh, in the mixture of sucrose and cellulose, uh, where, where if you record one dimensional spectra here, then you get like an overlap of all of these chemical shifts and you can't really uh, assign these signals. Of course, you can try to do a two dimensional experiment. However, this is done at natural abundance. 
So if you would like to get each component separately, you might need to perform um, like dissolve these compounds and maybe separate them by column and then record spectra of each component individually. However, if this method shows that you can actually use them and separate them quite well in the in situ, uh, in case when you have a differently, if, if both of these components have uh, differently relaxed, different relaxation rates. Uh, additionally, he also showed that you can use this for uh, a drug um, separate, separate, get, and get the spectra of each component individually, um, as in this case, as shown here. Um, so in my work, I work with the um, verbalizing S of fast transform uh, that is uh, initially written uh, by Stephen Hollinger's uh, program that works in Fortune. However, um, he, I think 10 years ago, uh, or maybe sooner than that, um, um, uh, this guy, uh, Ilari Martini, he adapted this code for the use of in a math lab, which is quite nice. And you can actually go and it really, it's really available. You can download it for yourself and try to use it. So when I started thinking about using this method for my type of materials, I thought it would be nice to test it for like model compound. And I came across this futurated four metal acrylate. And by looking at, at the literature, I found that the alkaline ester metal groups, they have very similar splitting, quite a splittings uh, that give a basically very, you know, this gives just a line shape that is kind of all for both of these uh, species together. However, looking at the relaxation date, I, I can see you can see that they both have very different T1 uh, values. And this material uh, gives an opportunity to test this in the transform this method if it works and how well it works inside the these relaxation values. So that is what I did. So I uh, performed a relaxation experiment and I processed my relaxation decay using this method. And you can see that this is the counterpart to get out where you get your chemical shift to the cancer distribution of relaxation values. And then we examine the relaxation values of uh, alkaline cell groups. You can see that they are fairly close to the, the ones reported in the literature. Um, yeah. So before I move to the next part, um, I'm happy to take any questions. And yeah. Oh, great. Okay, great. Uh, so we already have a couple of questions. Uh, the first is by Gabriele Stefanato. So what's special on inverse Laplace transform? Should we always use it or there are cases where it does not work? Um, so uh, in terms of the... So I think inverse Laplace transform is like um, quite nice technique to process relaxation data. Um, I think uh, if you are working with like very simple molecules or very simple systems where you might not expect to have a multiple exponential case, then you can probably use the usual approach. But there might be cases where we, as we, as we go forward, like in general, we, we are getting interested in more and more complex systems. So we might encounter uh, like a properties that like of a material that kind of have has differently relaxing um, regions, and then we can potentially use this method. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is a more theoretical question, I guess, a more basic. How inverse Laplace transform is different from the 2D Fourier transformation? Um, 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 I'm not entirely. Oh, I don't really know how to answer this. If you have an idea. Um, can you hear me? So uh, the Fourier transform transfers like um, periodic data to basically you know the the spectrum that you see. Whereas the inverse path transform transforms like sort of exponentials to separate signals. So they are not the same thing mathematically at all. Um, and they do very different things. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, somebody else is asking if uh, ILT can be performed actually on top spin or it requires a specific uh, software processing. So the one I'm using is using the MATLAB, but I think if I'm right, I think top spin, top spin bio spin might have this feature in it. And I remember, I think I was trying to use it. However, uh, for me, uh, when I was trying it, uh, it's just because it's already ready software, so you need to put in values and you kind of need to know what, exactly what you're doing at each step. So it's more like a, 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 I don't know, a box where you could plug in a values and you then try to use it. But in terms of using it via like a MATLAB script, it gives you a better like a feeling of like the, like you can actually read the source code and actually to have a better understanding of what exactly happens every time when you do it. I think also, uh, so the, the, the second paper presented by Usami, so I think uh, their method might be implemented with Joel. So I never used that, so I'm not entirely sure how it works and how well it is. And I think uh, the, the program that, that, that it uses it, I think it's called ROSY, so it's R-O-S-Y. Um, I never used it, but I think that is that is implemented in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how different should be the time scales in order to be able to extract uh, the rates without a lot of error? So, I think as it was like showed, uh, so so it's really going to depend. Uh, so, so I think I think better it would be. To use if your if your relaxation rates are quite different. Uh, however, um, in the paper by Lin, uh, shown by um, Lucia Friedman, uh, it, it showed that it, you can also separate rates about, for example, between one second and and two seconds. Uh, so, uh, however, you might need to get really good signal to noise ratio in order to do that. So um, I think ideally it would be probably better use for um, samples that definitely have very quite different relaxing, relaxing orders with respect to one another. So did I understand correctly that spectral overlap is not an issue? Your resolution should be the relaxation. Then. I mean, you need to have a relaxation, different relaxation rates, but spectral overlap is not a problem. No, I, uh, I don't think that, no, the spectral overlap is not a problem. It's just, yeah, it's the, 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 the relaxation dimension for that has to be, uh, like, fairly different. Um, yeah, but in order to get a good resolution in that dimension, you need to have really good signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. It's like one uh, of the yes, minuses of this method. So another question from Anira is, uh, is ILT dependent on experimental dead time? Uh, yes, I think it, this is like one of the, so it, it's kind of one of the, like the defects by the, so it's like one of the things that might create some artifacts in your, uh, in your spectra. So it might have an effect on that as well. So it could be, but then again, there might be ways how you can to investigate that as well and account for that. And I was wondering this correction that you applied uh, in your spectra when you have the artifacts, does it work even if you have overlap resonances? Because in your example, there were two quite uh, distinct in slide seven, for example. Yeah, so, so in here, so I'm not entirely sure how they did it, how they did this particular um, like fitting. But uh, so in this case, you're, uh, so what exactly are you doing here? You, you're resolving your um, differently. Uh, so you're resolving your different um, uh, line shapes and uh, it might have a slight effect on your line shape, I would assume, but then again, um, you probably would like, have some sort of noise variations in even in your like usual NMR spectrum where you get so nothing is like perfect perfect but 
but again, you can try with the model compounds and see how it looks like and have a better idea um, how it looks like afterwards. Okay, and maybe before we keep going, just one last question. How can one cross-check the weights of different relaxation times? Um, so I think it's more about the contributions of, I think what if the person might ask me is about the contribution of different uh, uh, like relaxation rates. Uh, I think in this case, the Universal Foster Fund can't really give you idea about uh, like if your if your both relaxing components are, for example, like one to one ratio or one to two ratio and so on. Because I also done like a bit of a analysis, like a synthetic. Uh, uh, I done like my own analysis where I kind of said like my relaxation all uses like for example one second and five seconds. And I'm gonna say that my one component is like definitely, like, I don't know, seventy percent more. And in the end, when I looked at the, my data, uh, I realized that you can't really say that. You, so the, the output doesn't really show that you have the like fifty, fifty, or seventy, thirty percent ratio between the signals. You can't really estimate that. You can't really use it to quantify them like that. But it gives you idea of whether or not you have like a distribution of relaxation values or not. Okay, maybe we can keep going and I'm pretty sure more questions will appear later. Yeah. Um, so. So, uh, so moving on to more complicated systems like uh, collagens, but before I maybe present you, before I present my data, I would like to um, um, tell you about what these collagens are, where we can find them, and why we want to study them. Um, so we all know that the tissues are not only made up by cells, the bulk space around them is filled with the extracellular matrix that is uh, where the most prevailing component is uh, collagen protein. And this uh, collagen scaffold protects and supports the cells. But besides this mechanical support, uh, these collagen proteins also uh, provide well defined ligand binding sites that, that is important in uh, biological roles uh, of, of these uh, materials. So, in order to do both of these uh, highly versatile and uh, uh, important roles, these proteins somewhat, may, need to be somewhat dynamic. And by studying uh, like the structure and the amount of these proteins, we produce better understanding of the uh, like flexibility of the tissues or like whatever happens, for example, uh, under pathological conditions, like for example, fabrication. Um, it, it would give us a better idea of what happens in, the, in these type of things. So the collagen molecules are. Um, consisting of three polypeptide chains twisting around each other, where each polypeptide chain is about 1,000 amino acids in length, and every third residue is glycine. And we often we see repeating triplets consisting of glycine choline and hydroxychloroquine. These collagen molecules can pack in the satellite pattern, um, giving these higher and lower um, molecular density areas known as graphene overlap zones. So when we look at uh, electron under electron microscopy, we can see that these, we can see this very like uh, characteristic uh, property of the collagen as this uh, like darker banding pattern as shown here. So in our group, uh, we use three different types of collagen sources. Um, so the first type of group of materials that we look are these uh, synthetic model peptides, which are um, about uh, 30 amino acids per polypeptide chain. So we can synthesize these and we can also, so this type of approach gives us better, uh, a better way of looking at very specific combinations of amino acids in the native sequence. And by this method, we can also introduce selective isotopic enrichment in different 
parts of the collagen. Um, the second group of materials that we use is the collagen obtained from a neutral cell culture. Um, my work, I use the sheep osteoblasts, and these cells are known to produce uh, um, highly rich uh, extracellular matrix that is uh, in a high content of the poly collagen. And we can also introduce an isotopic enrichment uh, during this collagen procedure, and we can uh, get an isotopic enrichment of different amino acids in our collagen. And the third type of material that we work is a very expensive one, which is uh, um, where we put um, a animal on the isotopically enriched the, uh, diet to get an isotopically enriched tissues. Uh, but this is more or less one-off experiment, and we use it to validate all in vitro subcultures. Uh, yeah. so, uh, so during my work, uh, to begin with, I decided that now we'll start looking at the model peptides, as I said, uh, model peptides. Uh, in the model peptides, you can look at very specific uh, sequences of uh, amino acids, as well as we can introduce isotopic nutrients in the various ways. And at the beginning of my work, I was interested in the background dynamics, and I thought that uh, nitrogen is a, as it is a part of the polypeptide chain, it is a good curve to look at background dynamics. So, so, so I selected a range of model peptides to, uh, where we have a different types of uh, uh, structures available. Uh, for more like native sequence. So we have these amino rich peptides like that, that have half triple helices and other type of peptides where we have these glycine solomine mutation that gives the a slightly looser a slightly looser helices. And by studying dynamics of these uh, peptides, it get, can give me idea of uh, like a scale or a range of possible values you could potentially expect in real collagen. So as I said, uh, the first group of peptides I choose to look at was the amino-rich peptides. And so these amino-rich peptides are like glycinicoline and hydroxycholine are used in the native sequence. Um, the, so the so there's a topic enrichment is like highlighted here in red, and the peptides in are slightly different from the model of F1, but we have this hydroxycholine to the choline mutation in the middle of the sequence. And if you consider the, the peptide sequences one and three and I ask enrichment, ideally I would expect to see just like a very similar relaxation behavior. However, there is a slight difference that shows that even the slight mutation has an effect on the flexibility of the collagen to the helix. And here is like an example of the relaxation data that we can get after the uh, when we process or relaxation decreases in the amino acid form, so we get very nice and uh, narrow um, signals. Uh, and, we, and you can see that we can get the relaxation values of these peptides. Um, so, another group of the peptides that I looked was these glycine to alanine mutated peptides. So, these peptides, uh, it, so this mutation in this peptide. Uh, generate, generates a void in the middle of the sequence where this methyl group is pointing in the triple helix. The old three polypeptide chains are now pushed apart. And uh, that, as I said, introduces void and it also introduces greater flexibility as it is affected by the relaxation value, um, especially when you look at the proline here. And additionally, just to look at other type of uh, destructive origin peptides, I looked at the solution ones where we have. Uh, one amino acid removal from the polypeptide sequence. So these deletion peptides generates a very destructive hydrogen bonding uh, compared to the normal type of uh, interchain hydrogen bonding that's in this example, hydroxychloroquine or E peptide. So this again generates quite a the dispersion of possible conformations and then as a result in lower amino acid values. Um, and finally, I looked at the uh, Peptide that, is, that has the sequence introduced in the middle that represents an inter interbrain binding site. 
and uh, how the copy enrichment is introduced at the beginning. And at the end of the sequence, where if you look at the relaxation values, you can see that the, uh, the, this N terminus side is more flexible compared to this um, C terminus side. And then we consider um, this peptide when it's in, in the bound state, as you here in the yellow, then there is a more reorganization of on this end of the peptide, which is just that this part might should be more flexible as it is affected by these relaxation lines. So besides just the looking at so uh, besides just looking at so the room temperature is trying to also perform the relaxation measurements across different temperatures. And uh, uh, by doing this, I kind of I gave me a bit more confidence in terms of using this in the as a form and obtaining that second values. And uh, I thought it would be a good place where to start, especially if we consider like model peptides, they, they shouldn't have any uh, like bimodal exponential case. So I, I thought it would be a good way of testing it with potential T1 values and, uh, and how well it actually works overall. So moving on from the synthetic model peptides to so more complicated systems. Um, so to the collagens. Uh, so in our group, we're not only looking at the healthy collagen um, levels, we also consider pathological conditions such as glycation. Uh, glycation is uh, defined as a non-enzymatic interaction between amine groups, proteins, and ambient producing sugars in exosolutions. In the collagen, uh, we have these uh, free amino groups, lysine arginine residues, uh, that are susceptible to lysis, this glycation, and eventually, through very complex chemistry, generates these advanced glycation age products shown here. And these are accumulated on the collagen tubules, um, which leads to the chemical and physical changes of these collagen tubules that, in, a, in a turn, alters the mechanical and biological properties. So I thought that it would be quite nice to look at the dynamics of these collagen triples and just see um, if we can get any like uh, more information by using in natural process form um, to compare maybe the structural changes with respect to like triples. So the first thing I did, I, would, I looked at the choline, glycine, and leucine. Also, perfectly in which the collagen fibrils where these amino acids are not directly involved in glycation, so it can be used to assess the indirect effects of the glycation on the fibril structure. And here is my quantum box that I obtained uh, after processing my relaxation data. So, in the terms of, um, so you can see that when we process the relaxation data of Choline glycine rich materials, we can get like a uh, distribution of relaxation values of each single component. And uh, after glycation, we can see that this distribution in this dimension has increased, and overall relaxation values has uh, slightly decreased, which kind of suggests that this material might become more heterogeneous. So when you look at the material that's been being enriched, leucine. We can see that the structure becomes slightly a bit more complex because we get natural abundance of other amino acids like choline glycine uh, overlapping with our signals. And uh, so the analysis of this uh, data becomes slightly a bit more complicated. However, after performing a natural constant form on the, this material, we can see that uh, uh, it separates these natural abundance signals coming from the choline and glycine. And it also gives the relaxation distribution of these regions shown here. And you can see that the relaxation values are uniform, showing that these regions are uh, tightly packed in the collagen chip of PLCs and have very uniform formation compared to the, has very uniform formation overall. After glycation, we can see that the, um, this, these side chains has like increased. We, we, have, we can see that there's a quite a dispersion of relaxation values after it, which suggests that uh, these new scenes now, after being in very nicely tight 
they had tuberculosis, are now assessing that more of uh, different types of conformations in these protein tubules. And this might suggest that we might be dealing now with also with the uh, destructive molecular ordering of, ordering of the protein tubules. Um, overall, the relaxation noise uh, going to be decreasing as it was similarly in the previously labeled sample. And we also get quite a, quite a larger distribution of the relaxation noise. Uh, additionally, I also look at the amino acids that are directly involved in the rotation as lines as and arguments. And another thing that I noticed when I process my data is that I get uh, two different phase relaxing regions in my uh, control plots. So again, the first thing that I thought it might be that there's dealing with some natural abundance in there. However, if I look at this arginine and which sample where we don't really get an overlap with any other amino acids like coming from natural abundance like choline glycines and so on, uh, you can see that we still have this, these two different relaxing regions. And as these amino acids are hydrophobic, they're hydrophilic, no, hydro, they are uh, water loving. Uh, so they are hydrophilic. So it might be that in this case, we're dealing with the uh, um, groups of amino acids that are either on the, on the surface versus the, the ones in interior. So the ones that are on the surface that have lower relaxing uh, components compared to the ones that are in the interior of the tubules and they have lower relaxing agents. It also could be the case that we're looking at the gap versus lower relaxants. However, uh, Looking at the data is not really too easy to prove whenever which one is true. So, after plotting these uh, materials, we still have these both relaxing regions, and we can see that again, similar as the previous ones, overall relaxation models are decreasing, as well as we get the slightly greater distribution of the we, we observe like the broadening of the this uh, relaxation dimension where it suggests they can. Greater distribution of relaxation values and again, the material becomes more heterogeneous. So, the further to confirm whether uh, we do get like structured molecular ordering, ordering of the particles, we can do this um, um, electron microscopy and look at, this, look at the um, surface of these particles. And after glycation, you can see that overall the binding pattern. Uh, is basically almost lost, as well as we see some uh, shredding of the collagen molecules. And additionally, uh, by looking at the protein, Hanumar, we can see that after glycation, they have increased water content in our collagen, again, suggesting that our collagen people can be forking up and uh, becoming more heterogeneous, and this might result in like, overall particles. Um, so, to kind of finish off with uh, analyzing uh, different types of materials using the isoportions form, as I said, in our group we use uh, three different types of sources, and uh, I had access to look at the uh, isoportions in which um, So, I thought it would be quite interesting to look at how the isoportions form would look in something uh, this like, highly enriched material. And uh, how you as you can see that overall we get very homogeneous relaxation, but again, I think this is the because of the dipole interactions as well as the skin diffusion that we can fairly homogeneous relaxation across the whole material. So we can do this on the carbon and we can also look at nitrogen. Nitrogen we might expect it's a bit, a bit of a distribution of relaxation values, however, uh, again it's fairly homogeneous. Uh, so to sum up, um, so uh, I have shown today that the uh, inversal class one can be used to estimate relaxation values in for example, crystalline solid samples, uh, as it is for example, and for the bigger, more heterogeneous biological materials, it can be the idea of the human dispersion and maybe we separate different relaxing regions as it was in materials where we look at the lysine and arginine and red origins. Uh, so this method is quite nice in terms that we don't need to go via uh, lengthy process of evolution of the, of the signals and hit each signal with a proper 
However, this method is sensitive to small optimize ratio as well as different kinds of uh, experimental artifacts. And with that, I would like to thank uh, uh, my group that I was working in, especially Melinda and Dave for supervising me. And uh, I would like to thank also Rakesh, Sunita, and Ori for introducing me to soul culture, and Ray and Adrian and Thomas for being wonderful colleagues. And of course, I would like to thank you for listening to me today. Good. Thank you very much, Eva. It was great. So we already have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one uh, is asking, how do you measure relaxation? I guess what sort of experiment? Is it direct carbon nitrogen measurement? And how long are typically these experiments? So what I... So I do a cross polarization experiment. So I do uh, inversion recovery. But for the carbon, it, it is mm, typically not that long. I would say probably it takes like um, 18 hours or like an overnight experiment. But it really depends on your signal to noise ratio. As I said, you really want to make sure you have a good signal to noise ratio. In terms of the nitrogen, it's of course, it's nitrogen is much more complicated than it. Again, I do the same type of experiment, cross-polarization, inversion recovery, but it takes longer. So it takes um, probably like at least maybe two or even three days to get good signal to noise ratio. But again, it really depends on the uh, isotopic enrichment, how much you have in the sample. Just building on that, what sort of signal to noise ratio would you say that you need a uh, minimum? Like what the sort so, of order? So in, I think in my case, I think for the model peptides, I had it at least like in the range from like the 50, even up to 30. Like so not know if it was okay. Uh, for the carbon, it was um, definitely much better uh, because you can get more signal out of it. But I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I did also try to do like some simulations uh, to, uh, like introducing, for example, noise just to see how how much noise would affect my data, and and, and overall, uh, I would say that the conditions I used were fairly okay. Mm -hmm. uh, could you comment on the impact of molecular mobility on the applicability of the uh, inverse Laplace transform? on the relaxometry data? And are there any comments on the sparse representation methods? Um, um, so if I understand it right, um, I'm not entirely sure if I understand the question um, correctly. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure, but maybe they are asking if the relaxation rates can be translated to mobility um, information about the mobility of the molecule. Um, I think in that case, uh, yeah, you can use that. So I think that's kind of what I did in terms of my model pathways where I looked at the very tightly packed for DOCs and then it's like a bit more looser. Uh, most of the ones I can think of the uh, ones with fluorescent to alanine mutation, where you have like again, uh, all three core peptides are kind of more pushed apart, and you get like a bit more of a possible variation in conformation. So, yeah, you can potentially use that and give kind of idea. But again, again, I would be very careful uh, analyzing such data. You would need to probably investigate your system in very, quite a great detail to kind of conclude these things. And somebody is asking if you would be willing to share your MATLAB code to analyze relaxation. Yeah, I'm happy to share it. I, as I said, it's available on the, on the MATLAB official website. But if anything, you can always uh, email me and I can, I'm happy to share it. Because it's nothing like very secret. But yeah, you can try it and see if it works for you. Know. Great. And another question is if you can perform this kind of experiments on quadrupolar spins? Yes, yeah. So as I showed, there was, uh, I used it for the term. Uh, so yeah, if you can use it. Um, 
but I think as long as your workstation is not entirely separate and you get good signal to measure, yeah, you can. Uh, from curiosity, what sort of feet were these measurements on? Sorry? Mm -hmm. What sort of field, uh, your magnet, uh, what was the... Oh, so I did all of my measurements at 400 uh, magnets, yeah. Well, let's finish here. I want to thank you for giving us this tutorial. It was great. <laughs>